Well, good morning, good morning, and happy Easter to everybody. Um, we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If y'all would stand with us as we begin worship. And before we do, I think Lisa has uh, something to ask y'all or say to y'all. Say, he is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. One more time. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. out together. Let no one call in sin remain inside the lie of inward shame. But fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and land for us. Oh, 
we are so glad that y'all are here with us this morning. You, you survived the uh, Arctic rains of, uh, of Los Angeles, California, or of Southern California, and made it here. Um, I, I drive in from Sherman Oaks, and as I was driving over um, Rocky Peak over the pass on the 118 uh, this morning, I was, like, it was all rain all through uh, Sherman Oaks and through the valley of Los Angeles. Then when I got over this peak, there was this big old rainbow as I was coming down. and It was just a neat reminder. And, uh, you know, I think with a day like today with Easter and all what this means and the celebration of it, I know some people are coming in this morning. Some of you are coming in, and you are just ready to celebrate. And you're, you know and you have this deep connection with, uh, with the day and what, uh, what the gospel means in your life, what Jesus means in your life. And some of us are going through really hard times. And what you feel right now, even coming in this morning, is you feel the rain. You don't, you don't see the rainbow. And what we, uh, what we really come in to celebrate today with Easter is, is that reality that the, no matter how dark the darkness is, no matter how long the night is, and no matter how much the cost is, what's on the other side of it because of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and of God shown through Jesus' sacrifice brings us together so that at the end, uh, that wins out and hope wins out and love wins out. So happy Easter uh, to all of y'all. And if you're coming in and you need a little extra kick this morning, we got some coffee in the back. We got coffee, donuts. Make yourself at home um, in this place. If you're sitting on the outside of these aisles and you have a bunch of chairs on the inside, see if you can make your way in in case we have some people that come in late. Uh, but we're so glad that y'all are here with us, and let's uh, continue in worship this morning. Coming with the heart of worship. I'm coming with the heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit. Take a 
see. Good morning, everybody. Christ is risen. My name is Kurt. I'm a pastor here. I'm so glad you're with us to worship today. I would like for us to begin with a word of prayer. God of glory, we ask you to fill your church with the power that flows from Christ's resurrection, that in the midst of the sinful world, it may be a signal, a signal of the beginning of a renewed humanity, risen to new life with Christ. God, we celebrate that around the world, people are giving you glory that you rose from the dead. We thank you, God, for the churches in our city right now who are gathering with us to proclaim that you are Lord and that you rose from the grave. Thank you, God, for the partnership throughout history and around the world of your saints who with us proclaim that you are king. May we have eyes to see it. Open our hearts, we pray today, that we may proclaim you and see you for how good you really are. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We have a video to show us a scripture reading this morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started to see. Both were running. But the other disciples outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise. Then the disciples went back to where they stayed. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they are put him. At this, she turned around and saw angels standing, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Good morning. No, maybe. Yes. Hello. Do I need the other one? They're working on it. Oh, there we are. Good morning. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen 
Happy Easter, everybody. We are so, so happy that you are here. My name is Tricia, if you don't know me. And if you are new and this is your first time, I want to extend a special thank you for coming and welcome and hello. We only have a few announcements this morning. Let's see. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of the volunteers who have tirelessly this whole week put all of this together for us today. So just a special little round of applause for all the volunteers. Thank you, thank you. And I don't think I see any, but if there's any kids that belong in kids' church, now, now is your chance. If not, you are more than welcome to stay. Um, two more announcements. These lovely flowers in front of us. After service, if you would like to take one home with you, just feel free. We have a $10 donation, and you can either get a hydrangea or a lily. Your choice. We have some up front, and we have some in the back. Those are for you guys. And also after service, the rain kind of put a damper on our normal Easter activities after church, but we still will have food and just hang out and be with people and fellowship and say hi to somebody new. And I think that was it. I think so. Happy Easter. Thank you. Back to you guys. Thank you. All right, if y'all would stand with us as we continue in worship this morning. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Praise your joy.
Uh, so, so who uh, we have, you know, different people like different songs. Who who grew up singing that song? Anybody? Okay, I know we kind of messed it up. We're playing it with guitars. There's no organ or anything like that. But uh, uh, I find with with music, there's this rich tradition um, where we both have people that have gone before us for hundreds of years that have all been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and writing songs about it. And then there are new things. And um, this next song we're going to sing, if, if you don't come here regularly, you might not have heard before. Uh, our team writes some songs sometimes, and we wrote this one as a, to try to kind of put into maybe more modern language what some of the gospel actually means to us, what, what it means in terms of the, the language of hope, what it, what it does that we can look to a God that loves us deeply enough that he would sacrifice everything for us so that we could come before God, not ashamed because of our imperfections, which we all have, um, but full of hope, full of joy, and full of love. And so uh, that's what this song is about. So if you uh, come here regularly and you know this song, sing it out. If you're brand new, uh, we're so glad you're here. Hear this and think about the ways that God might be speaking to you and speaking hope into your life um, this morning. song in the desert, a melody in the cold of night, in the darkness there's a treasure, I see it when I lift my eyes, I see it when I lift my eyes, and there's no Oh 
uh, one last song this morning before Kirk comes up. And I encourage you to take uh, this song, In Christ Alone, and, um, and just prepare your, your hearts, minds, quiet ourselves from the million of plans and text messages and emails. And uh, just really make this space uh, one that, that's open for us to hear um, Kurt's message this morning um, and to hear uh, the truth of the gospel and hear it in a new way uh, for each of us wherever we're at. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of Take a seat. If, if you are someone who travels often, I would guess that you have a checklist of essential items, all the kind of must-haves for your trip. Uh, it might just be in your head, uh, or it could actually be a real physical list of items that you take. And you know what, if you're, if you're really kind of a detail-oriented person, maybe you even have it laminated so you can like, check it and do it, use it over and over again. So what, what I'm talking about is this list of essential items that if you were to forget about them, to realize that you forgot about them, you would either turn the car around and make sure you go get it, or it would be something that it would be the first thing that you bought when you arrive at your destination. For example, if you were going on an international trip, 
you know that your passport is essential. You're not going to think to yourself, you know what, I brought it with me all those other times. I'm sure the customs agent is just going to be okay with it this time, right? Or if it doesn't matter how much of a super tough travel boss you are, if you forgot your phone charger cord, you are going to make sure that you find one. You might even be willing to pay for it with airport prices. Have any of you done that? I have, I have done that. Has anybody paid airport prices? You know why? Because it's essential. You're like, I know I need this thing. The Christian life is described often as a journey. And I, I don't know where you're at on that journey. If you are someone who is well-traveled and you've been on this journey with God for a long time, or if you're just considering it for the first time, I hope either way that you will join us in the next few weeks as we consider what some of these essential must-haves are for our journey with God. And if in the course of this series, you realize that you've started your journey without one of these, it's a good time for us to stop and pick it up and uh, continue before going any further. This week is the first of our Christian essentials, and, and the first essential is this. We are saved by grace. This is a must-have. You, you can't go on the journey of the Christian faith without this, or at least having a small idea of what God's grace is. There's a key passage that addresses this essential, and it's, it's based around the big thing that we're celebrating today, Christ's resurrection, and it's in Ephesians 2. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can open that to Ephesians 2, and while you're doing that, I'll give you a little bit of background. Now, this is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians in a city called Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. And in chapter 1, he spends a whole bunch of his time telling them how he's praying for them and how much, how much kind of just he likes them. Uh, he really thinks they're great and he loves them. Then in Ephesians 2, he's going to home in on the concept of grace. And he says the story of grace is going to be about three things. It's going to be about the big problem of humanity. It's going to be about the goodness of God who comes to meet that problem and about how God's grace then defines us as people. Let, let's read this passage, Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help our hearts, our minds, to understand what is written here, for it to penetrate deep in our hearts. May your spirit be speaking to each and every one of us now, and may our eyes be on Christ, the one who has died and rose again for our sake. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, the story of grace starts off with a problem. Author Tony Payne draws our attention to this problem. He says this, Human beings are clever, beautiful, loving, courageous, and full of potential. And then he continues, Human beings are stupid, dishonest, incompetent, greedy, violent, hate-filled, and corrupt. And, and those two statements are completely contradictory, but from our own life experience, we can all say that those two statements are completely true. 
So let's be real for a moment. We, we have all seen the best and the worst in humanity, and, and we ourselves are capable of incredible acts of goodness and kindness and love, but we're also prone to selfishness and greed and hate. I remember when my boys were toddlers, and I thought to myself, I, I need, I, I can't take my eyes off them. They might do something. And I also thought, I can't take my eyes off them. They might do something. You and I, we're, we have grown up beyond that, uh, but we're all still, we have that same paradoxical reality in us. And we are capable of grandeur and garbage, and sometimes right about the same time. So it's not just other people, it's not society that's to blame. If we're honest with ourselves, we're going to see that we are part of the problem too. And we might try to justify our actions or minimize our shortcomings. I've heard people say, well, you know what, I'm not a murderer or I take my grocery cart back, right? We're good people. We think that. But, but deep down, we know the truth. We're not perfect. No one's going to raise their hand and say that they're perfect. We've all fallen short in one way or another. And that's, that's where it ends up getting kind of uncomfortable. No one likes to admit their flaws or face their own brokenness. But the reality is we just can't ignore it. And we can't brush it under the rug or pretend that it doesn't exist. And this falling short, this brokenness, this rebellion, this separation from God, uh, we see that in these first few verses of Ephesians 2. And it's what Ephesians 2 calls sin. It's not just about specific actions. It's about our nature, that we're, we're people who are broken and lost and in need of a rescue. Okay, time out right there. You might be thinking to yourself, you know what, this is not exactly the theme of an Christ- Easter sermon that I thought I would be hearing right now. I thought this would be a little more pastel and a little less sackcloth, right? <laughs> Maybe you're thinking that. If you were thinking that, I would tell you, you know, on my end, I would rather start somewhere else. But it's helpful for us. I, I could tell you, I had an-, an adventure that happened last month that helps us to understand this a bit more. Uh, I went with my family in February to Moaning Cavern. It's up in Calaveras County. And after the tour introduction, the tour guide uh, oriented us to where we were going to go. The guide took us down into the cavern, and we walked through this narrow area up to where there's a huge iron staircase that, that spirals down to the bottom of this enormous chamber. The cavern is, is beautiful. It's amazing. But the most memorable part for me was the moment when she warned us ahead of time, but when she turned off all the lights in the cavern. And you want to talk about dark. I mean, dark, dark, right? She literally said, put your hand in front of your face. And I went like this and moved it. I could see nothing. You can see nothing. But then she lit a candle. And the idea was to say, this is kind of what the first people who explored this saw. But what I noticed was that one candle could press back the darkness in that cavern and brought a light into that room. And I say that because it's only when we really see the darkness for what it is that we can recognize the problem. That what we're doing, we're spending a moment right now as we're going to consider some of the things that maybe are not easy to hear, but it's a bit like turning off the artificial lights so we can see how dark the cavern is. And once we do that, we can more fully appreciate the light that God brings, this solution of grace that God has brought to our problems. And I'll tell you, this solution is nothing short of miraculous. It's amazing. But we're going to wait a couple minutes to get to that. In the first three verses of Ephesians 2, Paul says that without God's intervention, the situation was bad. He says, among other things, he says he wants us to see the darkness. He says, among other things, that we were dead and we were enslaved. So our problem is first that we were dead. Verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We have to be clear, this is everybody. He's not pointing to any particular segment of society or one group over here or there. It's it's not just people who are vocally against God. It's everybody. And he says in verse 3, we were all like this. 
He says that our problem then isn't just that we make some mistakes or that we don't just do what we ought to do. It is those things too. The things that we have done and left undone have led to spiritual death. So the problem is not going to be solved by new laws or a bit better self-esteem. It's not going to get there. The problem is so much deeper. The problem is that without Christ, we're dead. So it's difficult, though, to believe that we are dead. Uh, It seems like life can go on just fine without God. We can fall in love. We can enjoy art, go to concerts, nature, enjoy exercise. I think I heard that's a thing. Some of you enjoy enjoy exercise. Uh, All of those things are the kind of things that we can do. You think, hey, those point to somebody who's alive. It's a death, though, in an area that matters most. We can say that those people are still dead because it's in our soul. The problem is that we've been made by God, meant for relationship with God, but we are called toward God. We're unresponsive to him like a dead person. Author John Stott says that when somebody is spiritually dead, you can tell. They are blind to the glory of Jesus Christ and deaf to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They have no love for God, no sensitive awareness of his personal reality, no leaping of their spirit towards him, no longing for fellowship with his people. They are unresponsive to him as a corpse. And I'll say, if that's what it means to be dead, maybe it's less controversial than what we might have thought at first. A lot of us can remember being cold toward God having no desire for God at all. I remember in my own life what it was like to go through kind of religious motions without having any desire for it. And Paul is saying here that if there is a lack of life in our relationship with the living God, if that aspect is shriveled and dead, then no amount of success in any other area of our lives will ever be able to compensate for it. If Christ has not made us alive, then we are spiritually dead. And that was what our condition looked like before the Good Shepherd found us. So I'd like for you to think for a moment, what has your spiritual journey looked like? Would you say that you are responsive to God or are you cold to him? And maybe you know what you could do right now is you can silently, where you are, ask God to make you alive. We weren't just dead, though. We were also enslaved. Look at verse 2. He says, The the transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying our cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. So it's a picture of being under the control of someone or something that even if you wanted to change, you are powerless to do something about that. And it's kind of the the way that I've heard my friends who are alcoholic talk about the way, the relationship they have with alcohol. That, hey, when they're in the presence of it, they have no power. And the way that it comes out in us is that our lives and our thoughts seem to flow naturally in a direction that's away from God and, and more toward caring for ourselves in general. We naturally drift toward these things, cynicism and hate, anger, fear, selfishness, pride, all that kind of stuff. And even when we work on those things, maybe you've noticed, hey, it's hard for us to break the cycle. He says, we are enslaved. What's something right now in your life that you feel powerless to change? You, even as you're sitting there right now, you can talk to God about that thing. You can ask him to bring rescue in your life. All right, so we're looking at this dark cave of the human condition, our brokenness, our need for rescue that's connected to our own turning away from God. And it's time to shift to the focus of the hero of the story. But before we do that, I just want to say, I want to recognize that that's kind of weighty for us to think about our brokenness, our brokenness in the world, the systems that are perpetuated by people, perpetuated by me and others, we all are a part of that. So it's not easy for us to confront our shortcomings, our vulnerabilities, or to think about brokenness in the world. 
But really, it's, it's specifically in those moments of honesty that we're going to start to open ourselves to the transformative power of grace. So secondly, the story of grace has a hero. Verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. This letter to the Ephesians was written originally in Greek, and in the original Greek, this sentence starts off with the words, but God, but God. The verses before we learned, hey, we are dead, but, and by all rights, we should be locked out, but God, but God who is rich in mercy, but God who had so much love for us acted. Despite who we were, God's actions toward us have actually been that he's been driven by his own love for us, flowing from his riches in mercy. And so we have to understand that we were dead because it makes it all the more miraculous what God does next, that God never forgot about us. God never gave up on us. Christ met the darkness on the cross. And then brought his light and grace that we see now. We can rise with him in his resurrection. God has made us alive, alive with Christ. And that's the point where this intersects with Easter. It says in verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ. So the way that God expressed his mercy and love wasn't just with like warm feelings toward us. His mercy and love were expressed in the life and death and resurrection of Christ. You may be familiar with John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So the Bible declares that Christ's death on the cross was his act that, that pardoned us. It rescued us from enslavement. And Christ went down into death so that we could be raised up in resurrection along with him. So the problem that we had in the beginning, what we're saying is that Christ solved that problem. Christ's resurrection is not only his greatest miracle, it is a declaration that death is no longer in charge. Yes, we were dead, but God, but God. So the amazing news that we have in the Bible is that even though we're imperfect, even though we're broken and lost and blind and all that, Jesus Christ came to die for us. Christ didn't die for good people. Christ died for people who have been tainted by sin, who needed to be set free, people like me and people like you. He paid a debt that I owed and I could not pay. You probably have had moments in your life where you have fallen short, where you really kind of got it wrong. And you can imagine right now that God could actually erase that. By the grace of God, those things don't have to taint us anymore. In Christ, we can be forgiven. Not by fighting hard enough or trying to be good enough, but by simply asking for God's forgiveness. And that Forgiveness, that grace, ends up defining us. God's grace has defined us. How does it define us? Well, among other things, what our salvation by grace means is that we are no longer defined by the list of failures in our lives. We are no longer defined by the list of successes in our lives. We are now defined by the living God who has taken initiative to rescue us, to be in relationship with us. And so now we are alive in Christ. And that status is super secure. It says in verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So when you say that we've been seated, that means that the work is done. We've got our place. You've got our place to be. You're set. And in verse 7, it says then that the the purpose of that, the reason for that is that in order in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So that means that the implications of what Christ has done, it's going to reverberate 
forever and ever. I've seen clips of people who do kind of exceptional acts of kindness where, I don't know, they like order like a regular meal, right? But then they leave like a $1,000 tip, something like that. And then what they do is they interview or somebody questions the server afterwards. And, and the way we see that that act of generosity has this way of, of creating waves that continue. They, they ask that person, they say, and the person will just say, I can't believe how amazing this was. I can't, I can't tell you what a difference this is going to make in my life. And so in, in verse 7, is something similar. We are going to have the same reaction to God's kindness to us. In, in our lives now and on into the future, we're going to continue to just shake our heads and say, I can't believe how good God was to me. I'm so thankful. Look how amazing his grace is. Thank you, God. And we're not going to be able to brag, though, right? It's, it's, because, it's not because we're so amazing. It's, because, it's not because of our skill, of our craftiness. In verse 8, he brings together these two aspects that we've been talking about, about our, that we're spiritually powerless and how God intervened. It says this in verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. One thing that we can say about the Christian life is there has never, ever been a Christian who earned their salvation. And when we think about the brokenness of humanity, we can also say there has never, ever been anyone who deserved their salvation. It has only ever been by a gift of grace. And we are invited to welcome that gift so take a moment and think to yourself, have you, have you accepted God's gift or are you still trying to do it on your own? Are you still trying to define yourself? If you accept God's gift, you will know that you are known and loved by God and you have this new mission that's the last verse in our, our uh, bit here, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the the right response that we're supposed to have is obviously thankfulness, but we're supposed to live fully into this life he's given us. We we do good things for God. I think uh, doing good things from God or having our faith kind of exude out of us is actually a sign that our life in God is alive, that we actually have a faith that's a living faith. But it's always done in response to what God has done in us. That's God's work in us, this patience that we have for other people, any forgiveness that we have or kindness toward other people, they're always responses to the mercy and love that God has shown us. That's God's handiwork. And that that word handiwork there is poema in Greek. We are God's poem. We are God's masterpiece, his work of art. And God's masterpiece is that he's the type of God who remakes people. And that is the story of his grace, this grace in our life that it's not because we deserve it, but he is proclaiming and saying that we are worthwhile, saying that we are unique and loved. That's the part that's making us. That's the part that defines us. As we conclude our time together today, I want to leave you with a simple challenge for the week ahead. This week, I would like for you to pray a very simple prayer. It's a short prayer that comes from the Eastern Church in the 4th century, and it's called simply the Jesus Prayer. And it says this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's an ancient prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some people use this as a, as a type of meditation. It's not magical. It's not like a magical phrase or something like that. It is supposed to echo the reality of our hearts. That's the idea. I would love for you to pray that this week in response to Easter. The astounding news is that because Christ rose again, though, God is going to answer that prayer. That's the sure hope we have, that we are confident that God is going to honor that because God is rich in amazing grace. It's our first essential. We are saved by grace, and it is more than sufficient for our needs. 
What if we really understood the depths of the darkness that's in us and really understood the power of Christ's death on the cross and resurrection? Could, could we really live in the light of God's grace? I think that if we did that, our faith would not anymore look like trying to earn God's favor. It would just look like we're grateful people going through life. And our whole life would be marked by wanting to live out the implications of what God has done, to extend grace to other people, to to see my life molded, to look like my Lord, even in small interactions with people. And the idea of being saved by grace, we, we have to remember this is essential. It's transformative. And I want to tell you, don't try to do your journey without it. I hope you will join us as we continue to, through this series of looking at Christian essentials in the weeks ahead. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this. Uh, thank you for Paul sharing this word with us that we can think about depths and the heights of life in the world. We pray that we will be people who live fully into the life you've given us to become more of who you want us to be, to be set free, to be alive and more ourselves than ever before because we are living in relationship with you. May that be the case. So we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I know that you are God who is full of grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks. Praise God. The Lord is very good. Uh, We want to celebrate this with a physical act that lives out the grace that we're proclaiming. The act that shows that we are people who take in, not by our own merit, but receive the gift of grace that God has for us. And we're going to take communion together. Hopefully you got like a little little, uh, holy plastic cup. Um, (laughs) Or there were some gluten-free ones back there as well. If you did not get one, can you raise your hand? The ushers are willing to bring you one. Okay, you can get one. Uh, Come to this sacred table of the Lord's Supper, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you're strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and pray for the Spirit. Let's let's recite together the Lord's Prayer. So if you would rise with me and let's recite this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare for taking the Lord's Supper, we reflect on the reasons for our thanksgiving and faith, but also on our need for forgiveness and love. I know I prayed a moment ago, but I'd love for you to take a moment of silence to stand in your, in before the Lord. So take a moment of silence to, to talk to God. It says in 1 John 1, 9, that he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just, the forgiveness of all unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to tell us in the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul then reminds us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Jesus until he comes again. This is the Lord's table. It is Jesus himself who invites you to this meal, and this table is open to all who believe and have professed faith in Jesus Christ. 
You may now take the bottom part. Well, try to get the little cracker down there. You can take the little cracker bit off the bottom. Leave. Hopefully you didn't open the top already. Otherwise, you, you're on your own. I don't know. You're on your own. I don't know what to do. Try not to spill juice in your own lap. Take the little cracker. This is Christ's body broken for you. You may take it. You can open the top as well then. It has the juice in there. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Lord, we take these things together in connection with one another and with people around the world and throughout history. We proclaim that we don't do it on our own, but we need your body and blood in us. We need your gospel to change us. May we have you come out of us in our interactions around the world. 